And that is now the next question. If there was no state religion, why do we talk of secularism, which normally means the separation of state and religion? Why do we have to talk about it? If there is nothing to separate, why should we insist on this concept of secularism? So therefore, my first argument is that the concept of secularism has no relevance whatsoever to the Indian context. I would like to see an analysis showing me that there is a, a, a need to protect the Indian state from religious incursions. The only thing that Indian rulers were under compulsion to follow, well, theoretical compulsion. In practice, it's a completely different ball game. But under theoretical comp compulsion to follow was a code of ethics, a certain code of dharma, which is expounded in large number of texts. For example, when, um, uh, um, um, when Bhishma lies on his bed of arrows, before dying, as you know, you know he took enough time to uh, schedule his death uh, suitably so that he had enough time to give, um, to give Yudhishthira a long discourse on the duties of a king. And this is possibly one of the very first texts in India on, on uh, it's actually a code of governance. It is reflected in a lot of other texts, partly in Arthashastra of Kautilya. Uh, even Ramayana has long lectures on what a ruler is supposed to do, not to do, and so on. So these were considered to be, you know, uh, uh, and you have a lot of Raja Niti texts uh, all the way to the medieval times, quite a few of them. So this is what the rulers were supposed to be under compulsion to follow. And again, in inscriptions, you have a lot of kings boasting that they follow this code of ethics. You have even a Pandya king boasting, I forget who, uh, which king in particular, but boasting that his reign was more dharmic than the reign of Rama himself. You see? So the, the, these models were there, whether they were followed or not in practice, again, is a totally different ballgame. We can't go into such a historical analysis. But uh, this is what was, uh, let us say, the model that was over the minds of the rulers and not any particular religious uh, system. So if we look at the inheritance of this et ethos, we see that India has for ages past been a country of pilgrimages. All over the country you find these ancient places from Badrinath, Kedarnath and Amarnath, high up in the snow Himalayas, down to Kanyakumari in the south. What has drawn our people from the south to the north and from the north to the south in these great pilgrimages? It is the feeling of one country and one culture. So this is the cultural, fundamental cultural unity of India. And who tells us all this? Jawaharlal Nehru himself, again the art secularist, who acknowledges that there is a certain uh, background which we will call cultural, which is uh, behind India as a nation. And uh, another quotation which today would be regarded as highly controversial, even offensive to a large proportion of our intellectuals, India has all along been trying experiments in evolving a social unity within which all the different peoples could be held together while fully enjoying the freedom of maintaining their own differences. This has produced something like a United States of a social federation whose common name is Hinduism. Very objectionable, isn't it? Who said that? Rabindranath Tagore himself. What does he mean by Hinduism? Obviously not some narrow, a uh, set of rituals and a few texts. He means what precisely created this national network of cultural integration that Nehru was referring to under purely the angle of uh, pilgrimages. But there are many more angles which uh, 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 could be invoked when you look at the cultural unity of ancient India. So this was in 1917. Now let me.